The Desire of Ages, Chapter 51, The Light of Life. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. When he spoke these words, Jesus was in the court of the temple, specially connected with the services of the Feast of Tabernacles. In the centre of this court rose two lofty standards, supporting lampstands of great size. After the evening sacrifice, all the lamps were kindled, shedding their light over Jerusalem. This ceremony was in commemoration of the pillar of light that guided Israel in the desert, and was also regarded as pointing to the coming of the Messiah. At evening, when the lamps were lighted, the court was a scene of great rejoicing. Grey-haired men, the priests of the temple, and the rulers of the people, united in the festive dances to the sound of instrumental music and the chants of the Levites. In the illumination of Jerusalem, the people expressed their hope of the Messiah's coming to shed his light upon Israel. But to Jesus, the scene had a wider meaning. As the radiant lamps of the temple lighted up all about them, so Christ, the source of spiritual light, illumines the darkness of the world. Yet the symbol was imperfect. That great light which his own hand had set in the heavens was a truer representation of the glory of his mission. It was morning. The sun had just risen above the Mount of Olives, and its rays fell with dazzling brightness on the marble palaces and lighted up the gold of the temple walls, when Jesus, pointing to it, said, I am the light of the world. By one who listened to these words that were long afterward re-echoed in the sublime passage, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness apprehended it not. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And long after Jesus had ascended to heaven, Peter also, writing under the illumination of the Divine Spirit, recalled the symbol Christ had used. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. In the manifestation of God to his people, light had ever been a symbol of his presence. At the creative word in the beginning, light had shone out of darkness. Light had been enshrouded in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, leading the vast armies of Israel. Light blazed with awful grandeur about the Lord on Mount Sinai. Light rested over the mercy seat in the temple. Light filled the temple of Solomon at its dedication. Light shone on the hills of Bethlehem when the angels brought the message of redemption to the watching shepherds. God is light. And in the words, I am the light of the world, Christ declared his oneness with God and his relation to the whole human family. It was he who at the beginning had caused the light to shine out of darkness he is the light of sun and moon and star. He was the spiritual light that in symbol and type and prophecy had shone upon Israel. But not to the Jewish nation alone was the light given. As the sunbeams penetrate to the remotest corners of the earth, so does the light of the sun of righteousness shine upon every soul. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The world has had its great teachers, men of giant intellect and wonderful research, men whose utterances have stimulated thought and opened to view vast fields of knowledge. And these men have been honored as guides and benefactors of their race. But there is one who stands higher than they. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. We can trace the line of the world's great teachers as far back as human records extend, but the light was before them. As the moon and the stars of the solar system shine by the reflected light of the sun, so as far as their teaching is true, 
do the world's great thinkers reflect the rays of the sun of righteousness. Every gem of thought, every flash of the intellect, is from the light of the world. In these days, we hear much about higher education. The true higher education is that imparted by him in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He that followeth me, said Jesus, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In the words, I am the light of the world, Jesus declared himself the Messiah. The aged Simeon in the temple where Christ was now teaching had spoken of him as a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. In these words he was applying to him a prophecy familiar to all Israel. By the prophet Isaiah the Holy Spirit had declared, It is too light a thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. This prophecy was generally understood as spoken of the Messiah, and when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, the people could not fail to recognize his claim to be the promised one. To the Pharisees and rulers this claim seemed an arrogant assumption, that a man like themselves should make such pretensions they could not tolerate. Seeming to ignore his words, they demanded, Who art thou? They were bent upon forcing him to declare himself the Christ. His appearance and his work were so at variance with the expectations of the people that, as his wily enemies believed, a direct announcement of himself as the Messiah would cause him to be rejected as an impostor. But to their question, Who art thou? Jesus replied, Even that which I have also spoken unto you from the beginning, that which had been revealed in his words were revealed also in his character. He had been the embodiment of the truths he taught. I do nothing of myself, he continued, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. He did not attempt to prove his messianic claim, but showed his unity with God. If their minds had been open to God's love, they would have received Jesus. Among his hearers, many were drawn to him in faith, and to them he said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. These words offended the Pharisees. The nation's long subjection to a foreign yoke they disregarded and angrily exclaimed, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus looked upon these men, the slaves of malice, whose thoughts were bent upon revenge, and sadly answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. They were in the worst kind of bondage, ruled by the spirit of evil. Every soul that refuses to give himself to God is under the control of another power. He is not his own. He may talk of freedom, but he is in the most abject slavery. He is not allowed to see the beauty of truth, for his mind is under the control of Satan. While he flatters himself that he is following the dictates of his own judgment, he obeys the will of the Prince of Darkness. Christ came to break the shackles of sin slavery from the soul. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from the law of sin and death. In the work of redemption there is no compulsion, no external force is employed. Under the influence of the Spirit of God, Man is left free to choose whom he will serve.
In the change that takes place when the soul surrenders to Christ, there is the highest sense of freedom. The expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. True, we have no power to free ourselves from Satan's control, but when we desire to be set free from sin and in our great need, cry out for a power out of and above ourselves, the powers of the soul are imbued with the divine energy of the Holy Spirit, and they obey the dictates of the will in fulfilling the will of God. The only condition upon which the freedom of man is possible is that of becoming one with Christ. The truth shall make you free, and Christ is the truth. Sin can triumph only by enfeebling the mind and destroying the liberty of the soul. Subjection to God is restoration to oneself, to the true glory and dignity of man. The divine law to which we are brought into subjection is the law of liberty. The Pharisees had declared themselves the children of Abraham. Jesus told them that this claim could be established only by doing the works of Abraham. The true children of Abraham would live as he did, a life of obedience to God. They would not try to kill one who was speaking the truth that was given him from God. In plotting against Christ, the rabbis were not doing the works of Abraham. A mere lineal descent from Abraham was of no value without a spiritual connection with him, which would be manifested in possessing the same spirit and doing the same works, they were not his children. This principle bears with equal weight upon a question that has long agitated the Christian world, the question of apostolic succession. Descent from Abraham was proved not by name and lineage, but by likeness of character. So the apostolic succession rests not upon the transmission of ecclesiastical authority, but upon spiritual relationship. A life actuated by the apostles' spirit, the belief and teaching of the truth they taught. This is the true evidence of apostolic succession. This is what constitutes men the successors of the first teachers of the gospel. Jesus denied that the Jews were children of Abraham. In mockery they answered, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. These words, in allusion to the circumstances of his birth, were intended as a thrust against Christ in the presence of those who were beginning to believe on him. Jesus gave no heed to the base insinuation, but said, If God were your Father, ye would love me for I proceeded forth and came from God. Their works testified of their relationship to him who was a liar and a murderer. Ye are of your father, the devil, said Jesus, and the lusts of your father it is your will to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and stood not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Because I say the truth, ye believe me not. The fact that Jesus spoke the truth, and that with certainty, was why he was not received by the Jewish leaders. It was the truth that offended these self-righteous men. The truth exposed the fallacy of error. It condemned their teaching and practice, and it was unwelcome. They would rather close their eyes to the truth than humble themselves to confess that they had been in error. They did not love the truth. They did not desire it even though it was truth. Which of you convicteth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Day by day for three years his enemies had been following Christ, trying to find some stain in his character. Satan and all the confederacy of evil had been seeking to overcome him, but they had found nothing in him by which to gain an advantage. Even the devils were forced to confess, Thou art the Holy One of God. Jesus lived the law in the sight of heaven, in the sight of unfallen worlds, and in the sight of sinful men. Before angels, men, and demons, he had spoken unchallenged words that from any other lips would have been blasphemy. I do always those things that please him. The fact that although they could find no sin in Christ, the Jews would not receive him, 
proved that they themselves had no connection with God. They did not recognize his voice in the message of his son. They thought themselves passing judgment on Christ, but in rejecting him, they were pronouncing sentence upon themselves. He that is of God, said Jesus, heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. The lesson is true for all time. Many a man who delights to quibble, to criticize, seeking for something to question in the word of God, thinks that he is thereby giving evidence of independence of thought and mental acuteness. He supposes that he is sitting in judgment on the Bible, when in truth, he is judging himself. He makes it manifest that he is incapable of appreciating truths that originate in heaven and that compass eternity. In presence of the great mountain of God's righteousness, his spirit is not awed. He busies himself with hunting for sticks and straws, and in this betrays a narrow and earthly nature. A heart that is fast losing its capacity to appreciate God. He whose heart has responded to the divine touch will be seeking for that which will increase his knowledge of God and will refine and elevate the character. As a flower turns to the sun that the bright rays may touch it with the tints of beauty, so will the soul turn to the sun of righteousness, that heaven's light may beautify the character with the graces of the character of Christ. Jesus continued, drawing a sharp contrast between the position of the Jews and that of Abraham. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Abraham had greatly desired to see the promised Savior. He offered up the most earnest prayer that before his death he might behold the Messiah, and he saw Christ. A supernatural light was given him, and he acknowledged Christ's divine character. He saw his day and was glad. He was given a view of the divine sacrifice for sin. Of this sacrifice, he had an illustration in his own experience. The command came to him, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him for a burnt offering. Upon the altar of sacrifice he laid the son of promise, the son in whom his hopes were centered. Then, as he waited beside the altar with knife upraised to obey God, he heard a voice from heaven saying, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. This terrible ordeal was imposed upon Abraham that he might see the day of Christ and realize the great love of God for the world, so great that to raise it from its degradation he gave his only begotten son to a most shameful death. Abraham learned of God the greatest lesson ever given to mortal. His prayer that he might see Christ before he should die was answered. He saw Christ. He saw all that mortal can see and live. By making an entire surrender, he was able to understand the vision of Christ, which had been given him. He was shown that in giving his only begotten Son to save sinners from eternal ruin, God was making a greater and more wonderful sacrifice than ever man could make. Abraham's experience answered the question, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In the words of Abraham, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And in God's provision of a sacrifice instead of Isaac, it was declared that no man could make expiation for himself. The pagan system of sacrifice was wholly unacceptable to God. No father was to offer up his son or his daughter for a sin offering. The Son of God alone can bear the guilt of the world.
Through his own suffering, Abraham was enabled to behold the Saviour's mission of sacrifice. But Israel would not understand that which was so unwelcome to their proud hearts. Christ's words concerning Abraham conveyed to his hearers no deep significance. The Pharisees saw in them only fresh ground for Cavallin. They resorted with a sneer, as if they would prove Jesus to be a madman. Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? With solemn dignity Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Silence fell upon the vast assembly. The name of God given to Moses to express the idea of the eternal presence had been claimed as his own by this Galilean rabbi. He had announced himself to be the self-existent one. He who had been promised to Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from the days of eternity. Again the priests and rabbis cried out against Jesus as a blasphemer. His claim to be one with God had before stirred them to take his life, and a few months later had plainly declared, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Because he was, and avowed himself to be, the Son of God, they were bent on destroying him. Now many of the people siding with the priests and rabbis took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself, and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. The light was shining in darkness, but the darkness apprehended it not. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. It was generally believed by the Jews that sin is punished in this life. Every affliction was regarded as the penalty of some wrongdoing, either of the sufferer himself or of his parents. It is true that all suffering results from the transgression of God's law, but this truth had become perverted. Satan, the author of sin and all its results, had led men to look upon disease and death as proceeding from God, as punishment arbitrarily inflicted on account of sin. Hence, one upon whom some great affliction or calamity had fallen had the additional burden of being regarded as a great sinner. Thus the way was prepared for the Jews to reject Jesus. He who hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows was looked upon by the Jews as stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, and they hid their faces from him. God had given a lesson designed to prevent this. The history of Job had shown that suffering is inflicted by Satan and is overruled by God for purposes of mercy. But Israel did not understand the lesson. The same error for which God had reproved the friends of Job was repeated by the Jews in their rejection of Christ. The belief of the Jews in regard to the relation of sin and suffering was held by Christ's disciples. While Jesus corrected their error, he did not explain the cause of the man's affliction, but told them what would be the result. Because of it, the works of God would be made manifest. As long as I am in the world, he said, I am the light of the world. Then having anointed the eyes of the blind man, he sent him to wash in the pool of Siloam, and the man's sight was restored. Thus Jesus answered the question of the disciples in a practical way, 
as he usually answered questions put to him from curiosity. The disciples were not called upon to discuss the question as to who had sinned or had not sinned, but to understand the power and mercy of God in giving sight to the blind. It was evident that there was no healing virtue in the clay or in the pool wherein the blind man was sent to wash, but that the virtue was in Christ. The Pharisees could not but be astonished at the cure. They were more than ever filled with hatred, for the miracle had been performed on the Sabbath day. The neighbors of the young man and those who knew him before in his blindness said, Is not this he that sat and begged? They looked upon him with doubt, for when his eyes were opened, his countenance was changed and brightened, and he appeared like another man. From one to another, the question passed. Some said, This is he. Others, oh, He is like him. But he who had received the great blessing settled the question by saying, I am he. He then told them of Jesus, and by what means he had been healed, and they inquired, Where is he? He said, I know not. Then they brought him before a council of the Pharisees. Again the man was asked how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. The Pharisees hoped to make Jesus out to be a sinner, and therefore not the Messiah. They knew not that it was he who had made the Sabbath, and knew all its obligation, who had healed the blind man. They appeared wonderfully zealous for the observance of the Sabbath, yet were planning murder on that very day. But many were greatly moved at hearing this miracle, and were convicted that he who had opened the eyes of the blind was more than a common man. In answer to the charge that Jesus was a sinner because he kept not the Sabbath day, they said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? Again the rabbis appealed to the blind man, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Pharisees then asserted that he had not been born blind and received his sight. They called for his parents and asked them, saying, Is this your son who ye say was born blind? There was the man himself, declaring that he had been blind and had his sight restored. But the Pharisees would rather deny the evidence of their own senses than admit that they were in error. So powerful is prejudice, so distorting is pharisaical righteousness. The Pharisees had one hope left, and that was to intimidate the man's parents. With apparent sincerity, they asked, How then doth he now see? The parents feared to compromise themselves, for it had been declared that whoever should acknowledge Jesus as the Christ should be put out of the synagogue, that is, should be excluded from the synagogue for thirty days. During this time, no child could be circumcised, no dead be lamented in the offender's home. The sentence was regarded as a great calamity, and if it failed to produce repentance, a far heavier penalty followed. The great work wrought for their son had brought conviction to the parents, yet they answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Thus they shifted all responsibility from themselves to their son, for they dared not confess Christ. The dilemma in which the Pharisees were placed, their questioning and prejudice, their unbelief in the facts of the case, were opening the eyes of the multitude, especially of the common people. Jesus had frequently wrought his miracles in the open street, and his work was always of a character to relieve suffering. The question in many minds was, would God do such mighty works through an impostor, as the Pharisees insisted that Jesus was? The controversy was becoming very earnest on both sides. The Pharisees saw that they were giving publicity to the work done by Jesus, 
They could not deny the miracle. The blind man was filled with joy and gratitude. He beheld the wondrous things of nature and was filled with delight at the beauty of earth and sky. He freely related his experience. And again, they tried to silence him, saying, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. That is, do not say again that this man gave you sight. It is God who has done this. The blind man answered, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then they questioned again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? With many words they tried to confuse him, so that he might think himself deluded. Satan and his evil angels were on the side of the Pharisees and united their energies and subtlety with man's reasoning in order to counteract the influence of Christ. They blunted the convictions that were deepening in many minds. Angels of God were also on the ground to strengthen the man who had his sight restored. The Pharisees did not realize that they had to deal with any other than the uneducated man who had been born blind. They knew not him with whom they were in controversy. Divine light shone into the chambers of the blind man's soul. As these hypocrites tried to make him disbelieve, God helped him to show by the vigor and pointedness of his replies that he was not to be ensnared. He answered, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The Lord Jesus knew the ordeal through which the man was passing. And he gave him grace and utterance, so that he became a witness for Christ. He answered the Pharisees in words that were a cutting rebuke to his questioners. They claimed to be the expositors of scripture, the religious guides of the nation. And yet here was one performing miracles. And they were confessedly ignorant as to the source of his power, and as to his character and claims. Why? Herein is a marvelous thing, said the man, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshipper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. The man had met his inquisitors on their own ground. His reasoning was unanswerable. The Pharisees were astonished, and they held their peace, spellbound before his pointed, determined words. For a few moments there was silence. Then the frowning priests and rabbis gathered about them their robes as though they feared contamination from contact with him. They shook off the dust from their feet and hurled denunciations against him. Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they excommunicated him. Jesus heard what had been done, and finding him soon after, he said, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? For the first time, the blind man looked upon the face of his restorer. Before the council, he had seen his parents troubled and perplexed. He had looked upon the frowning faces of the rabbis. Now his eyes rested upon the loving, peaceful countenance of Jesus. Already, at great cost to himself, he had acknowledged him as a delegate of divine power. Now a higher revelation was granted him. To the Savior's question, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? The blind man replied by asking, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee.
the man cast himself at the Saviour's feet in worship. Not only had his natural sight been restored, but the eyes of his understanding had been opened. Christ had been revealed to his soul, and he received him as the scent of God. A group of Pharisees had gathered near, and the sight of them brought to the mind of Jesus the contrast ever manifest in the effect of his words and works. He said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Christ had come to open the blind eyes, to give light to them that sit in darkness. He had declared himself to be the light of the world, and the miracle just performed was in attestation of his mission. The people who believed the Saviour at his advent were favoured with a fuller manifestation of the Divine Presence than the world had ever enjoyed before. The knowledge of God was revealed more perfectly. But in this very revelation, judgment was passing upon men. Their character was tested, their destiny determined. The manifestation of divine power that had given to the blind man both natural and spiritual sight had left the Pharisees in yet deeper darkness. Some of his hearers, feeling that Christ's words applied to them, inquired, Are we blind also? Jesus answered, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. If God had made it impossible for you to see the truth, your ignorance would involve no guilt. But now ye say, we see. You believe yourselves able to see, and reject the means through which alone you could receive sight. To all who realized their need, Christ came with infinite help. But the Pharisees would confess no need. They refused to come to Christ, and hence they were left in blindness a blindness for which they were themselves guilty. Jesus said, Your sin remaineth.